Hello and welcome to this webinar from the National Tooling and Machining Association and the Precision Metal Forming Association. This is a Washington DC update on federal government policy developments. I'm Caitlin Sickles with the Policy Resolution Group at Bracewell. On today's webinar, we have Paul Nathanson, also from PRG at Bracewell, and we have Omar Nashashibi from the Franklin Partnership. We do not have John Guzik with us today. Uh, he is the other on the ground lobbyist here in DC as part of the Franklin Partnership, um, where they do, uh, where they represent NTMA and PMA on policy issues up on Capitol Hill. Uh, for people who may be new to this webinar series, PRG, my colleague Paul and I do the public affairs and strategic communications for NTMA and PMA. We have a lot to cover in today's webinar, so thank you for tuning in. Um, we are gonna talk about what's going on in Congress. We're gonna give you a regulatory update. We'll talk about trade and tariffs and supply chains, and we'll do a new segment on this webinar, Charts of the Month. Um, there is a slide coming after this one, and brace yourself, people, because it is the April content summary slide. Somehow, my colleagues on this webinar purport that we are gonna get through all of this in a 30-minute time. So I'll just go ahead and tell you now, the good news is this webinar is being recorded, and you'll be able to download uh, this webinar as well as the PowerPoint that goes with it so that you can review later as I assume, Omar, that you are going to be going at record speed today to cover all of this content, you and Paul as well. So let me turn it over to you, Omar, to start. They're at bullet point one, tiny font, Congress passes all of the FY24 bills. Um, I'll go to you to kick us off. And I know you made me promise I would in fact go through every single word in a very yeah. slow pace. So to start that off, Caitlin, uh, thank you very much. Let me just start with Capitol Hill and where we are. Obviously we avoided a government shutdown by sheer fact that we did not have one towards the end of March going into the two week August excuse me, uh, recess for the Easter break that Congress takes every year. As of this recording, today is Friday, April the 5th, both the House and the Senate will be returning to Washington from that two week recess coming up here on starting on Monday, April the 8th, where they'll be in Washington for a couple of weeks prior to leaving yet again around the end of the month, around April 26th for several more days. So a short period of time left, Congress did finish their government spending bills, ended up being about $1.8 trillion in funding across all 12 bills that the U.S. Congress is required to pass by October, by the October 1st deadline, none of which were they able to do, no surprise. So here we were five and a half months into the fiscal year of fiscal year 2024, and that's when Congress got around and was able to pass it with no significant concessions to the sides that were holding it up, none of that being much of a surprise. At the same time, on March 11th, the President Biden's budget did come out. It's called a PBR for a reason. It's a request. It's a non-binding document, which is why you'll notice zero slides on the PBR included into the slide deck. We have a saying, con whatever the President proposes, Congress disposes of, especially as it relates to the PBR that comes out every year, and it's a guiding document, particularly in an election year. We did notice an indication of where the government spending process may be here moving forward for the rest of the calendar year in the U.S. Congress. We do have the committee chairwoman of the House Appropriations Committee, Kay Granger from Fort Worth, Texas, a Republican, announcing she would be stepping down upon that completion of the FY 2024 spending bills. Obviously, she believes, like many of the rest of us, that there is going to be a serious unlikelihood of any legislating with regards to the fiscal year FY 2025, which is what the PBR came out with that kicked off the process here. There's going to be a new chairman that takes over by the time any of you hear this, and that is going to be likely the congressman from Oklahoma, Tom Cole, and we'll see how much power he has. Again, they're not gonna be moving much bills on that side as well. We, for you defense folks, there is indication that the House is going to try to move a defense authorization bill that's called the NDAA that they passed every year since the early 1960s. But on that front, we don't believe that it will pass prior to the election coming up in November of this year. And that brings us backwards to taxes. Still, obviously, we're having our holdups with regards to taxes and our what we're trying to get through. That would be a reminder, a fix for the research and development tax. Right now you are paying taxes on your R&D activities and have to amortize them over five years. 
You also have your bonus depreciation has fallen now to 60% effective January 1 of 2024 from 100% that we had given you under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, among some other harmful tax changes that are costing you all on average well over a quarter million each year and added tax liability. Word that remains, and I had a call with a conservative from Missouri Senate office this week, and the Senate office was sympathetic, agreed with me on the provisions, agreed with me on the points, said he had four other meetings similar to mine on R&D, specifically on that day when I spoke to him. But his point was also that they are still deferring to the Republican lead tax writer, Mike Crapo from Idaho, to whom I told them directly that I do not believe is going to turn into a yes vote, which is why we need other offices like theirs who have heavy manufacturing to come forward. So as of right now, we do not have progress beyond where we had discussed previously. We still have the Republican leadership in the Senate, including those two that are vying to replace Mitch McConnell as Republican leader into the next Congress, also both being out as vocally opposing unless they see some changes. Any changes, a reminder, would require us to possibly go back to the House or would be an expansion of all the provisions that many of the Republicans in here are professing that they have some challenges with. Our window is certainly narrowing to move this bill in 2024. As I mentioned, we have Congress returning the House Senate next week. There has been a rule procedure set in place, what's called a Rule 14, which allows Chuck Schumer, the majority leader in the U.S. Senate, to bypass a committee. That Rule 14 paperwork was taken care of about two weeks ago. And so that does mean procedurally we do have the ability, if he so chooses, for Chuck Schumer to bring the tax bill directly to the floor. There's two different things on this. There's some that are Democrats in the Senate that have tight elections, like Sherrod Brown of Ohio, who wants to have a vote right away, believes even a failed vote with Republicans voting against the child tax credit and business provisions that we all support will help his reelection. There are others that are trying to convince Schumer to not put a failing bill on the floor for the policy reasons that are out there. Again, in my conversations that I continue to have as I speak to folks on the Hill, is that if we do get a floor vote on this bill, we will get our 60 votes that we need, including at least the 12 Republicans that would need to account for the at least one or two Senate Democrat losses that we're expecting, largely because getting to a bill in 2025 increasingly will make retroactivity for your R&D even that much more complicated. And that continues to be our message there. This is coming week here is going to be a big one, especially with the 15th falling on a Monday, meaning the conclusion of the tax season for those that aren't doing the extensions filings, obviously are still due, and that's where we end up on the taxes. Chuck Schumer did release his agenda for the remaining of the session, at least into the rest of the spring, and where he would like to see some of the bipartisan legislation that has been moved forward, at least from Senate committees, and a number of those could start to move when they come back between April 8th and then before they leave again towards the end of the month of April. And they also will, again, keep in mind, you've got a Memorial Day break, you've got another couple of days where they're not gonna be here in Washington. We really only have 36 legislative business days in the House of Representatives until July 4th. Keep in mind about 11 days thereafter, you're gonna have the presidential conventions coming up in Milwaukee and then a month later in Chicago, or excuse me, inverse that. And that's where you're gonna start seeing additionally more difficult for them, the parties to get, get things through the House and the Senate. We do believe that, especially with the president visiting Baltimore today, that there will be some kind of a supplemental spending bill to address infrastructures that relates to the Baltimore Key Bridge. And that will certainly have some made in USA requirements and by American requirements for some of the funding and spending in there. And we'll keep an eye out and focused on that as well. My personal belief is that on the tax bill, we might have a pretty decent chance of trying to attach our tax provisions onto the key bridge domestic supplemental, especially if that grows and also starts to add on Ukraine and other war supplemental funding. That is a possibility as soon as this week, we're gonna see additional conversations with regard to some of those supplementals that are out there in addition to railway safety requirements. Uh, the uh, Railroad Administration just came out and said two person crews are gonna be required. Obviously that's gonna create some controversy up on Capitol Hill for several reasons. And we'll see where that ends up. But those are some of the requirements that we see. There's also on the House side going to be some areas on surveillance. But for the most part, Schumer's going to try to get through what he can in a bipartisan manner. And that further complicates on the tax bill, especially if it is not perceived as being bipartisan, despite us getting 85% of the vote over in the U.S. House of Representatives. I did want to flag one other issue on the legislative front. This is now law. 
and I wanted to flag it here as in regards to was included in the transportation part of the government spending bill that President Biden signed several weeks ago. In the fiscal year 2024 law, there is a provision that is calling on the Department of Transportation specifically to enforce against any companies that are intentionally placing the Made in America label on any product that was not wholly made in the US and that person or that company shall not be eligible to receive any contracts or subcontracts with funds that are made available under that law within the Department of Transportation. We've discussed this in the past over the last three or so years with regards to labeling of made in America. Keep that in mind that that is, has a very, very specific designation when it comes to marketing. And that is important that you are understanding the complexity of that designation because all of your materials must going in there, including the metal, must be made in the USA, made in America, if you are going to affix that for your promotional purposes. Again, that is a lawsuit waiting to happen. And now you can lose your government contracts. That enforcement, expect that to step up. We also saw the Department of Transportation separately move forward with ending the 40 plus year old Buy American waiver. That's pretty much been a foundation of a way many of the Federal Highway Administration transportation programs have been funded and financed over the years where products can claim that they cannot secure the manufactured goods in that timely or affordable manner, and therefore they've been granted the waiver for a number of reasons. Now the Federal Highway Administration is gonna seek additional information from those companies that are seeking a waiver to purchase from overseas, many of the components and parts that you or your customers make, and that had identify what the steps they've done with regards to the availability and to make sure that the effectiveness of some of the Buy American waivers are not undermined with regards to those specific manufactured goods and the domestic availability. I've worked with the office uh, White House that has the Made in USA office, and they're always very interested in seeing any examples where companies are trying to go around this and claiming that a part or component is not made in the US. So please definitely reach out to me or to Jenny at NTMA and Christine at PMA if you'd like more information on some of those issues if you've lost business to a competition claiming on a transportation federally funded project that cannot find what they need here. I wanted to reinsert this area that we brought up a number of years ago towards the end of the Obama administration and throughout Trump, that for those of you that are hiring veterans, there is an award that goes out with different medals that are uh, virtual medals that are awarded based on the number of veterans that you're hiring in a given year. I just wanted to flag this out there, especially for those of you that are in the government contracting space. It does not, there's no financial benefit to being part of this other than when doing the right thing, helping a community that's often underserved, and then also being able to use it in your promotion and your marketing as well. We did a survey back in January with regards to immigration and visas that whether our members are working with their employees or perspectives on behalf and trying to secure visas on their behalf. So on for to that end, we wanted to flag that there is a new H-1B system for employers. The FAQ is specific with regards to allowing multi company and organ individuals within the organization to help prepare that H-1B petition and registration to simplify that process and that procedure over there as well. An issue on which we've been lobbying for use for some time now deals with the National Labor Relations Board on the joint employer rule. This is something you'll rec recall that a joint employer could be deemed to be that employer for the purposes of the terms and condition, even if you are not exercising direct control over that individual, we call the indirect or unexercised potential control would have potentially required you all to be considered a joint employer for purposes of pay, discrimination, scheduling, and a whole host of other complications. NLRB has been working on this for some time. There has been a federal court that has stepped in and said that the NLRB cannot move forward and they have, have put forward a delay with regards to the final rule and what they can move forward. The NLRB is appealing this and trying to have the circuit moved up here into the Washington DC area from down in Texas in the Fifth Circuit region. And we'll see where that ends up going as they narrow the ability of the NLRB to move forward on the potential on that final rule there as well. Another one on which we've been working in our coalition partners will be filing amicus briefs and legal challenges on this front deals with the finalization of the third party worker walk around rule. When an OSHA inspector is doing an in-person worker walk around, they can, an individual employee or a group of employees may request representation to join that OSHA employee on that walk around. When the inspector is going, they have the right to decline 
but they remove the requirement that the individual have a specific expertise in that area. So no longer are you only looking at industrial hygienists, for example. You could be looking as a representative of it being a non-employee that could be out there. It could be a trial attorney, it could be environmental activists, it could be a union representative, even if you're a non-union shop. The rule is effective on May 31st of this year as a final rule that's in there. And if the OSHA inspector agrees to allow this individual there, then you certainly must by then hopefully have sought legal guidance, but there you're gonna have very difficult problems moving forward. Something to track closely. Again, we expect some legal challenges prior to the entry into force coming up on May 31st, but that is something that we have been watching and working on going back to the Obama era and just start for yourselves to watch those as well closely. At the apprenticeship level, two updates here as well. And this we're seeing to go a little bit more broadly than just within the Department of Labor issues what we call training and employment notices that go out to stakeholders. They put on a new one a few weeks ago with regards to the quality of pre-apprenticeship programs and having the equal opportunity uh, language that's supposed to be a part of any apprenticeships and final rules that were included in there. So while they're saying that pre-apprenticeship programs are not subject to EO requirements that identify specific actions for creating discrimination and harassment free apprenticeship process and environments that they do want to see incorporating the elements of that regulation e in uh, pre-apprenticeship programs may also benefit those registered apprenticeship program sponsors. So the sponsors that are going to have to submit some of the EEO requirements, they are pushing down and trying to tell those folks that they want to see additional EEOs even in the pre-apprenticeship programs where they may not have already existed. The White House going back is now issuing an executive order where it is directing and instructing federal contractors at all agencies to identify whether or not they should be emphasizing registered and pre-apprenticeship programs. For example, as of right now, they're not mandating, but they are looking at and instructing the government contractors to look at whether including requirements or application evaluation factors or incentives for those government contracts or solicitations or even for grants if they employ workers on projects that are going to be receiving federal funding who have completed a registered apprenticeship program or pre-apprenticeships. Again, this is in line with our comments that we filed that were due on March 18th with regards to the requirement to eliminate the ability to use competency-based programs and only focus on time-based programs, which is what the Department of Labor is proposing there as well. So as you can see, they're taking more of a whole of government approach when it comes to the registered apprenticeship programs. Switching over to a few areas on the climate area, the Securities and Exchange Commission, we previewed this on our March 1st webinar as the following week, they were going to issue their rule. The Securities and Exchange Commission only issued their rule with regards to scope one and two climate disclosures for publicly traded corporations. There are roughly 6,000 or so publicly traded corporations under their and related agency purview. Of those, the estimation was roughly 2,800 companies would have been subject to this regulation. A court has subsequently stepped in and put the SEC climate rule disclosure rule on hold. However, of certain of critical importance is the Securities and Exchange Commission only included disclosure requirements for that regulated community for scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions. Scope one is what your facility itself is putting out. Scope two is the, what the facilities from which you're securing your energy, such as your utility, and what they're putting out and emitting and how much of it you're consuming. They did not include scope three that goes down through your value supply chain that would include you all into those so publicly traded. Now, while that is some relief at the SEC level, particularly that they do not include scope three for suppliers and that there's a court action, keep in mind states such as California, New York, the European Union themselves and others are already moving forward with these requirements. So you are not totally off the hook and continue to watch out for those requirements as well. For you in the automotive industry, no surprise in this election year that we do have the EPA auto and truck greenhouse gas standards that are out there. And what we strongly suggest is, again, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is to seek advice, seek from counsel. I know that Paul Nathanson over at Bracewell and they're the legal team that he works with and coordinates with is gonna be able to circulate a little bit more information on the SEC and the next steps with regards to the court order. So Paul, appreciate you doing that and we'll make sure that that link gets out there as there was I know, quite a bit of confusion about who might be regulated and who may not. Again, keep in mind that if your customer is asking for it, usually you're going to need to respond or jeopardize that contract that's out there. And similarly, when we now get into the EPA's auto truck and greenhouse gas emission standard, we do now have the new model year numbers with the Department 
of transportation, the EPA giving it the OEMs an additional year in terms of total compliance and reducing the emissions reduction levels that they want to see. To oversimplify it, they're pushing things out by a couple of years and allowing them to now go into about 2032 MY before they have to switch over and have the new regulations. Keep in mind, California still has a 2030 requirement, but at the federal level, they are allowing more time and it would not reduce the overall emissions, but would change the scale. What we're placing here is for some of you that are component manufacturers, tooling manufacturers, machine shops, or other suppliers in the tier one through three, one largely one and two range for these industries. We do now have tables where you can identify not only at the automotive, but also at the light truck level, which OEMs and which of those companies are going to be required to have certain projected targets. And you can see some of the scale and how the aggressiveness for certain vehicles are going at certain rates here. And that should also please be passing along to some of your sales folks and how you're starting to plan your future on where you might see some of these programs as well. And once, if you do have a change in administration, for example, switching from Republican or switching over to Republican from Democrat in the White House, this is what we're starting to see some regulators employ a tactic that we can say is a forever regulation. For example, what California just did several weeks ago with the company Stellantis that has a number of those vehicles on the previous slide that you saw is two things. In addition to cutting a deal that Stellantis will create investments in charging infrastructure, including with financial dollar amounts, they are also looking at it from the standpoint of if there are a, if there is a change in administration in Washington and in Washington or through a court order says that California in on its own cannot set greenhouse gas emissions that other states such as the 12 that currently do conform with what California Stellantis did is their signatures that you can see through this link on the agreement that they will continue Stellantis to abide by the agreement set in place, moving with the existing standards through model 26 year, and then into sales requirements for 2030. Even if the California Air Resources Board is un unable to enforce its own standards as a result of judicial or federal action. So as you start to see some of how the Europeans are trying to insulate against Trump, states such as California are starting to cut side deals with publicly traded companies. And this is exactly what I said was going to happen during the Paris climate issues, when Trump came in the first time. You're starting to see these publicly traded corporations and certain states taking steps. That is the stick side of the approach. Here's an example of the carrot side where the Biden administration recently announced $6 billion for 33 projects across the United States with regards to carbon decarbonization. This is a very high priority for the Biden administration. The Department of Energy has been very active in this space since they issued their roadmap in September of 2022 for industrial decarbonization for industry. Just this last week, DOE just issued their roadmap for decarbonization of buildings, and that includes more traditional structures, office buildings, but also some of your structures as well. I'm going to provide three examples on this slide and the next. Here's for iron and steel. They identified and are funding six projects for iron and steel to look at clean hydrogen fuel direct to reduce the iron making facilities and the energy usage and to reduce the emissions coming through the process of steel making and more importantly they're looking at the replacement of coal that would also be able to create and manufacture high grades of steel for a certain industry for the automotive while reducing the carbon footprint on the process heat side they're also looking at two projects on the electrification of boilers and again that is a high priority in the electrification of the process heating industry and something that we're watching closely on the aluminum side they did also select five projects there for moving forward on aluminum and metals for recycling of both aluminum and copper. Copper is starting to receive additional attention as, as one of the metals also that our members have reported some challenges with securing in the USGS a couple of years or recently included that as well as a priority. And so you're seeing on the high purity aluminum needed for the defense and energy sectors, they are also focusing on copper for EVs and semiconductors with some of these projects that are out there. Lastly, on the regulatory side, hopefully, again, I keep saying this last reminder on compliance, employer retention tax credit. If you are still having challenges or uncertainty on that, some of your voluntary options have now ceased and they are now starting to tout the number of dollars that they are returning in that the IRS has looked at and returned, uh, secured more than $225 million 
from taxpayers with a number of processes that are still going through that disclosure program. And they have another $3 billion that they're reviewing under the criminal investigation. So that process will continue for the next couple of years. And reminder that Congress is looking to shut that program down. Applications are still possible, although Congress retroactively will close it January 31st if that gets through. Uh, for you trade folks, this one's very significant in terms of what the new Department of Commerce new process is on anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Uh, quickly, not a trade lawyer, anti-dumping, that's what a entity in the United States or elsewhere would use, a company would use and petition for an anti-dumping in order to make up for a foreign competitor selling a product at below fair market value. So somebody selling a product, dumping it in against you, and you can't afford the same bottom price as they can because they're selling it illegally, you have a trade remedy called dumping, anti-dumping, and you're allowed to bring that forward. They're changing the process there in order to say now that if you are transnational subsidies are eligible to CBDs and also part of the dumping process, they're also looking at that. On the countervailing side, the transnational subsidies, that is where you're seeing countries such as China providing illegal subsidies into a third country, whether it's in Africa, Asia, or somewhere else around the world. And it's coming really from the Chinese government into that company that's operating elsewhere. And so now it's getting a made in country X instead of made in China. Now the United States government is going to allow countervailing duties to countervail that illegal subsidy that's being provided by that third party country into that third party producer. And that is something that we've been calling for through legislation. The Commerce Department is rescinding an existing standard that they believe uh, bars them from doing that as well. Also on the similar side with regards to the labor and being something that is countervailable and, and price distorting rather on the dumping side of it, this is the AD. If you do not have labor or environmental or human rights enforcement, intellectual property, non-enforcement of existing rules and standards, the US government is now gonna consider that a price distorting activity or non-action by that government entity and therefore make that product subject to anti-dumping. This is very significant and scheduled to go into effect at the next several weeks here. To that would, effect, hey Omar, I would only add on that, and I, I know we don't have a, a lot of time, but only add that Commerce Department is known to always find dumping in these cases, and this will now just make it even easier and also make the dumping margins pro probably a lot bigger, meaning larger duties on imported items. That's right, Paul. If I'm not done at 12:30 now, that is your fault for those seconds. But no, that, I appreciate that, Paul. That that's absolutely correct. There's two sides to this. If you are on the petitioner side and you are seeking protection for that product that is coming in because you know the Chinese or others aren't enforcing laws internationally or otherwise that should be, then that creates a challenge and you should have a right to be able to petition. At the same time, especially to those that are serial filers of cases on steel, for example, this is certainly going to drive up some of the prices that are in some of those areas and make it more uh, costly for importing and overall, even if you're not importing, the price of, market, of metals in the domestic market. So I, I appreciate that as well. Uh, this goes back to the 1960s, so I have to flag it since the case is finally here at last. This is when automotive imports, particularly from France and elsewhere, would be coming into the US saying these are passenger vehicle, passenger vans rather, when really they're cargo vans, which have a much higher duty rate coming in. So what autos OEMs would do is they literally put one bolt into a seat in the middle, randomly in the back of these vans and now say, look, it's a passenger van and then take the bolt out once it was imported in the US and it would go back to being a cargo van. And now Ford is having to pay $365 million for this as as a because they've avoided that 25% duty rate for all of these years that are out there. So something to float out there. And Paul, I'll turn it back over here, you as well, on the grain-oriented electrical steel and to provide a little bit of color of how this is happening, particularly due to the congressional delegations in Pennsylvania and over in, uh, in Ohio. But effectively, Department of Energy has weakened one of its own rules effect that was meaning to streamline a key industry on energy efficiency and reduce emissions. The Energy Department just announced literally yesterday that it was going to allow the continued use of grain-oriented electrical steel instead of using amorphous steel in 95% of the transformer for distributions, that it, distribution transformers rather, that it wants to use moving forward and allowed for an additional couple of years of transition time frame and then would allow the 75% of the market to continue using grain-oriented electrical steel. As Paul, you can imagine after a number of unions and those delegations that are running for re-election and Senate in particular, 
weighed in because that was going to be a significant amount of metric tons. 340 million metric tons would have been cut out. Now it's only 85 million metric tons. And I think they were talking about 100 million homes, something about that. Or yeah, me. you know, I, I think nothing gets uh, Washington, D.C. Riled, more riled up than uh, when they can get their hands on one of the when, when one of these rules goes too far. So as you said, the DOE proposed far stricter uh, standards for trans transformers back in 2022 and they uh, received a lot of uh, grief over it not only by uh, folks in the industry including like the uh, trade associations including the National Rural Electrical Cooperative Association but they got their congressional delegations very active on it so as you said the D the DOE and uh, finalized rules that um, would uh, give a, a much a longer period for compliance so um, it's one of those election year uh, things where the uh, administration's climate goals uh, kind of clash with political realities. Well, and to that effect, Paul, I mean, the prices are impacted across the board. Right. So this is our latest uh, steel price chart from uh, Steel Benchmarker. And as you can see, uh, prices have gone down a bit, but you can see the U.S. price there is still uh, quite uh, higher than uh, prices over, uh, by our overseas competitors, which is really the the benchmark where a lot of you all, um, you know, as we tell both members of Congress and we tell members of the media that the most important thing about steel prices uh, a lot of times is what your competitors overseas are paying. That's right. A few other things on trade, and please do type in any questions that you've got or any clarification you'd like on the right-hand side in either the question or into the chat box, and we'll go ahead and answer that in about two minutes as we get ready to wrap up. Did want to flag that again, picking up on some of the climate talks here on the grain-oriented electrical steel comments that were just made. The Office of the United States Trade Representative has sent an official communications through the World Trade Organization to our trading partners outlining the request to start coordinating efforts in incorporating climate related trade measures into trade policy. And specifically, they're looking at the European Union and other countries that are beginning to use carbon border adjustment mechanisms as the United States starts to explore what is the carbon price and footprint of domestic industry here in the United States. And they're trying to find ways to coordinate that a little bit better and asking for a report in additional meetings on that front in two parts, one being the US being concerned about potential tariffs being placed on US exports due to a lack of a carbon border adjustment mechanism here in the United States and how to coordinate efforts going against China in particular over the next couple of years and something to watch. As Caitlin alluded to, starting to formalize some of the charts that you all might find of use of interest. Here are the latest numbers that came out this morning at 8.30 Eastern with regards to the economy adding 303,000 jobs that are out there. We'll show and point out on manufacturing. The average work week change remained unchanged over over time, did slightly edge down to 2.9 hours in the month of March as reported in the two surveys that are used to collect this data there as well. In the bottom right corner, you'll notice on the jobs created, we say 303,000. There obviously has been a drop off since October of 2022 in the number of manufacturing. Total FTEs net that have been created, I think it's around 36,000. And so that has certainly leveled off from the bounce back from pandemic. But as you'll see, we did add 4,000 durable good manufacturing jobs in the month of March as identified. This chart is some separate data and came out earlier in the month. It's called the JOLTS, Jobs Opportunity, uh, Jobs Opening Loss Transitions uh, data here. And this gives you also a sense of the current job openings with regards to where we are in manufacturing. And there's a slight lag in this, 360,000 job openings in durable goods manufacturing down from 408 and then down about 100,000 for year over year numbers, as you'll identify there. Wanted to flag that we do have the 2017 and 2018 now, the equal opportunity and equal uh, EEOC data that did come out with regards to both pay by sex and by ethnicity and by race. And we'll flag those numbers for you here and put out in comparison for male versus female hiring. It should be a wage medium pay that's in here to also break this down by region. This is some of the data that's now been reported and now collected electronically that started happening towards the end of the Obama administration and how they're aggregating it there as well just came out on March 12th. We wanted to also put this one in there just for a chart that you could know if you wanted a trivia question. The U.S. is now officially the largest oil crude oil producer in the world and creating more 
in history than any other country anywhere, including in the Middle East. So we thought we'd throw that out there. But it's a fun fact for you to take a look at. Blue is the United States over here compared to the Saudis, which are on the right-hand column, and the Russians are continuing, obviously, to export. But the U.S. is now officially the largest producer there. And this is the warning sign we've been uh, telling folks about that was going to come ever since the new negotiations of the new NAFTA came through and entry into force is that you're going to continue to see Mexico being a backdoor for exports into the United States. And we do officially now have Mexico Im Mexican imports exceeding those of China coming into the United States. Those are the official government numbers. Not a surprise that it happened. It probably would have happened earlier were it not for the pandemic. At the same time, you're seeing the Chinese price of their goods falling entering into the United States by 3.3%, which now means that you are again competing with uh, cheaper products that are coming in there. And that's something to focus on as well. Now going into the a couple other areas on media, Paul and Caitlin, I'll turn it over to you and I'll answer the one question that we've gotten so far. Thanks, Omar. Um, I will just jump in quickly to say uh, thank you to our media volunteers who participate uh, in media inquiries when we get them. This is a request. So my pre my preview thank you to now give you a request uh, for we have two requests in from um, these outlets from Wall Street Journal and from AP. If you read these questions and you um, feel like you could help to answer them, please do let us know. Um, these are journalists, journalists and outlets that we work with frequently. And of course, we'll help you to be prepared for the media interviews and to do well. We'll participate in the interviews with you if you prefer. So um, if this if you think that you can answer either of these questions, please do let us know either in the chat or following up with us by email. On, and just a clarification on the second one, and I was uh, I was talking, I was very eloquent, but I was on mute. Um, the uh, AP request has been filled, and uh, we've had two of our members um, quoted in the AP story. And a little background: every month, uh, AP reporter is assigned to write about the jobs report and to give some life to the numbers. Uh, AP likes to talk to business owners, particularly manufacturers. So um, we are in the rotation of some of the writers who write. They, they kind of rotate around. And Paul Weissman, who wrote a great story about productivity that quoted NTMA and PMA members, um, is in, was in contact. And we had two uh, NTMA members this month be quoted in the story uh, that, we'll, that we'll send around. So it's a nice advertisement for your companies. And it helps out Omar and John and me and, and Caitlin. So thanks for your participation. Absolutely. And similarly, thanks for your help in uh, doing play tours. Here's an example of a member that just did host a uh, congressperson that we know very, very well, Mike Kelly from Northwest Pennsylvania. So thanks for that. And obviously taking the pictures really helps get that message out that you all can use in the community and we can use with our advocacy efforts and getting that voice out. Please, as always, listen to our podcast. We recorded one the other week and just giving updates here and there, both on the political side and the latest going on on Capitol Hill and your support has always been greatly appreciated and that's how we keep this going the three of us were just texting now uh this is an anniversary again for good and bad reasons we started this obviously during covid pandemic and it has been four years and now just about a month so we have definitely crossed 50 of these webinars and we appreciate all of your support and hope that you have found the, them useful over the last four years beginning for those reasons we did have one question. Anyone else, please do type them in the right-hand side over either in the chat box or in the question box, and I'll go ahead and answer those. One question was, any news regards changes to the generalized system of preferences, miscellaneous tariff bill, or the trade adjustment assistance for firms, for community colleges, for individuals, for farmers? Had a meeting on that with Ways and Means Committee staff last month now in uh, middle of early March. And where that stands is they have a concept of where they'd like to be in terms of moving that. GSP still has some challenges with regards to India. The Republicans believe that Democrats are going to insist on trade adjustment assistance, inclusion and expansion in, in, in exchange for miscellaneous tariff bill and GSP. Miscellaneous tariff bill right now has the biggest problems because of the perception that they're allowing goods to come in from China. So I'm hearing they're working on language that would tighten that up and to clarify, even if you're on the threshold for MTB, that if it's a Chinese product that is not allowed to enter in receiving duty free treatment. So that we believe is getting some changes along with tightening up some of the requirements for GSP moving forward. The other question is on GSP retroactivity going back to December of 20. 
one or 20, uh, three years now at this point. And then also on TAA, seeing what Democrats are gonna insist upon was the issue when I spoke with Republican staff a couple of weeks ago. So we are not as further along in that uh, that process as we would hope to be. Uh, any other any other questions that you all might have? And yes, it has been apparently four years of us doing these now on monthly, but thankfully it's not weekly like it used to be because those were again for, for tough reasons. I Thank you. That was 971 slides that we've done in four years. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate you and Caitlin keeping track of the words that I put on slides. And yes, when it takes 10 hours to put a slide deck together that you get done through in 35 minutes, it is depressing. <laughs> Thank you everybody for your time this month. As always, we will be back next month in the interim. Please feel free to reach out with any questions or inf more information.